Hello, welcome to Dan's Model Works, and today we're going to be reviewing the Mill MI-10 helicopter from A Model. In case you're not familiar with the company A Model, they're from the uh, from Russia, and they've done a lot of subjects that uh, the mainstream model making companies don't usually do. They do a lot of uh, a lot of aircraft and things from the U.S as well as their specialty seems to be doing uh, um, kits from the former Soviet Union. And before we look inside this big boy here, this is 172nd scale, I'm just going to show you a little bit um, about a kit that I made a few years ago, once again by A model, so you can see what we're getting into. Okay, now before opening the big box that has the MI-10 in it, and I thought I would show you um, something that A model released a few years ago. This is the Piasecki H-25A Army Mule. Now this was definitely a limited edition kit in that uh, the, the molding wasn't super crisp and the detailing wasn't extensive, but it built up into a nice model. So in a second here I'll show you uh, the completed uh, Piasecki army mule, so, so then we can see what the big kit could be built up into. Now I completed this about two years ago, and I didn't do any scratch building with it. What you see here is exactly as it built out of the box. Here is the other side of it, and as you can see there is some cockpit detail. There really wasn't much of an interior inside it. The wheels were nicely detailed, and the tail wheel was fairly crisply molded. In terms of detail on the rotor heads, there wasn't a lot, but we're not talking shapeless blobs either. Now this is a shot of the underside. Now, on the real helicopter, this is a uh, this opening allows air to get into the air-cooled radial. Now, they did mold the air-cooled radial in there, and there's also that flat slab is some sort of a radiator. I'm assuming that's probably to cool the various transmissions that are inside. Um, it wouldn't be for the engine itself, but it was a nice touch, and it certainly showed that uh, even though it's a limited-run kit, they weren't just, uh, just going to fob over the detail. Overall, I felt that this kit built up very well. So now let's go back to the MI-10 and see just what kind of goodies are in that box. Okay, so now let's look at this kit. It comes in a very sturdy box. It's fairly large. Um, as you can see, it's got a corrugated bottom on it so that if you are going to be mail ordering this, it probably will get to you in one piece. It has a very nice picture on the front of it. It looks to me like it's a photograph that's been retouched. If you look carefully here, you can see that some of the struts look like they've been touched up uh, post-production, which is fine. And as you can see down here, it's 172nd scale. If we look at the side of the box, we have a potted history in English and in Russian. And if we flip it around the other side here, we've got some of the other kits that they've done. This is a TU-126, looks like an AWACS. Um, over here we have the Buran Space Shuttle, which was uh, the Soviet Union's attempt at a reusable space shuttle program. Uh, an airliner, and this looks like another AWACS. And of particular interest for helicopter fans, we have the Mil V-12, which was the side-by-side -side experimental double rotor that they I think it was about the mid-70s that they came out with that. So, let's open the box and see what we have inside here. And, well, this is interesting. Don't know why it's in such a big box. However, all of the parts are enclosed in this plastic bag. So, at least you know they haven't been rattling all around inside the box in their entirety. So, let's maybe start off by looking at the instructions and the decal sheet. 
All right, so here we have the instructions. They're in the form of a booklet and they've got some statistics here. It's width 115 millimeters, length 456 millimeters. Parts count they say is 292 pieces. I don't know if that includes parts that are not used. The scale is 100 or 170 second scale. It's pretty much the same potted history that they had on the outside of the box. Um, it's in English and Russian. Going down to the bottom here, they have uh, what paints that they're suggesting that you use. Now, they're calling out the paints in humbrol paint numbers. Now, some people might get a little upset over that, but at least they're saying humbrol 147 light gray. So it's not like you are looking at a bunch of paint numbers with no identity as to what the colors are. I know Airfix used to do that a few years ago and it really annoyed a lot of people. So let's open it up and see. It starts with some sprue maps. And as you probably noticed when we opened up the box, the sprues are not very large. Now I already counted the sprues. I come up with 26 sprues. I don't know if that's a record, but it's certainly the most sprues that have ever been in a kit that I've put together. As a matter of fact, one, two, three pages of sprue maps. Now some of the parts are not used. They're denoted in gray. Uh, the assembly starts in the cockpit. Now certainly there's an awful lot of parts in here. It looks like it's a full interior for the cockpit. Then you move on to, looks like the, the engine assembly up at the top. Now here is the tail assembly and putting the fuselage together. Now I don't see any interior other than the cockpit. But given that this is 172nd scale, and the only thing you can see in will be these portholes. It's not like there's a drop ramp or something like that that you can look right up and see. So I don't see that as being a big problem that there's not a full interior. Moving on. Base assembly of the tail. Uh, the landing gear. Now this looks like it's going to be fairly complex. You might even want to have a jig to hold it up in the air while you put this landing gear together. Probably going to be one of the most fiddly landing gears that any of us have ever put together. Moving on, we've got the landing gear on the other side. Uh, tail rotor assembly certainly looks fairly complicated. And like a lot of uh, Soviet helicopters, this has the external strap-on fuel tanks. Uh, one thing you may have noticed is each of the steps basically lists all of the parts that you're going to need. So if uh, you might want to have a pen handy and mark off which part you've glued on or highlighted or something like that. This is the platform that goes underneath. Now you don't have to use the platform. Um, depending on the load, they sometimes would not have the platform. Back in the 60s, and there are videos on YouTube showing them demonstrating the MI-10, they would have like a big truck or a bus drive onto the platform, and then they would just fly away with it. I encourage you to look up those videos. They're pretty cool. Moving on, we've got the main rotor head. And this is interesting to note. Once you put the main rotor head together, it just goes through... A hole in the top of the fuselage. There's no retaining lug or anything like that. Some people may be bothered by that. I like this, especially in a large helicopter, because let's say you want to take it to your local modeling club and show it off when you're done with the rotor on top. I can pretty much guarantee by the time you get it there, you'll break it. Nice thing about this is you can take the rotor off. You can put it in a separate box. Um, if you're moving, uh, there's all kinds of times when you might need to move your model and it's always easier if you can take a big rotor assembly like this off. Moving on, <clears throat> we have one, two, three paint schemes. This one is from the 1980s, Afghanistan. It's basically gray. This is from one that was based in the Ukraine in the 1970s gray. And this one is from the 1960s. Uh, it looks like it was based in Poland and gray. So you have your choice. You can paint it any color you want, just as long as it's gray. So it does look like they're calling out all of the decal locations, which is nice. And once again, they have 
what colors you're supposed to use. Now let's look at the decals over here. It doesn't look like a very large sheet, but given that the, uh, you know, the, the, the stars, what else are you going to have? It's not like it was sold to two or three different countries. Now, if we look here and here, you can see the registration marks. If we look carefully, we can see that the black and the red are not perfect. The red is off just a little bit. However, the white is perfect. You can't see any white sticking out. Now, given that this is a Soviet Union aircraft and we've got the stars, if the white was not properly registered, these stars would pretty much be unusable. Um, if we look at the other decals, these are the instrument panels, and they look, they look awesome. And, of course, we have all the various data and warning plates and things like that. I, once again, I built an A-model kit a few years ago. I didn't have any problems at all with the decals. I found that they went on really good. I think I used deco setting solution and they reacted fine to them. So I don't think you're going to have any problems at all with these decals. Okay, before we meet the parts, I just want to point out that right here on the front of the instruction sheet, they point out this model is executed on technology short run, which means that uh, the molds really aren't intended to be uh, living on for decades and decades. The idea is that they can execute the kit maybe two or three times and that's it. So, and as well, they say only for experienced modelers. Um, in other words, there might be some cleaning up to do or things like that. So let's see how the parts really do stack up. We'll start with the front fuselage. If we look carefully, there's some louver detail here. The detail on the panel lines is fantastic. It's very slightly recessed. Um, if anything, uh, we're going to have to be careful that we don't put too much paint on this model. Otherwise, we could lose those panel lines. And we'll move on to the tail. And one thing I should point out is if I flip these parts over, there's no lip for when we put these together. So if you're concerned about the strength, you might want to put a plastic fillet inside here in order to reinforce those joints. But as I said, it's limited run technology. So they don't necessarily have those sorts of things. Oh, one other thing I should point out. There are no pins for lining the parts up. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, because I find even on mainstream kits, oftentimes those pins are just slightly off, and they're more trouble than they're worth. Next sprue is the top of the fuselage, and this is the engine to sell here. These are the air inlets for those giant turbo shaft engines. Um, we have some other inlets here, and they all look to be fairly well detailed. Some nice louver detail on here. We have the engine exhausts, as well as detailing for the fronts of the turbo shaft engines. Now, until we take these parts off and go to glue them together, we're not sure as to how well they're going to fit together. Um, judging from the care I've seen in the way this kit is made, I'm assuming that there's not going to be any severe misalignment problems. <clears throat> to give you some idea of how fine these parts are, this looks to be antennas and grab irons. And these are, no, actually, my mistake. Those are all the various controls for the cockpit, all the various levers and things, and control yokes. And they are extremely finely molded. And while we're on the subject of the cockpit, there's the cockpit parts right there. You can see some of the seats. This is the instrument panel. I wouldn't be too upset over the flatness of it because they've given us a decal to put on there. What I'd like to point out about that is if we flip it over, 
This is the back side of the instrument panel. And it is just loaded with sh with shapes and uh, and uh, relief detail. And the idea is you can see that from outside the helicopter through the windows. So if you paint that up in various shades of uh, uh, light gold, uh, zinc, aluminum, everything like that, um, it will look fantastic because what you're looking at is the back of the instrument panel. Here is the sprue for the tail rotor. Just four blades on the tail rotor. And then we have the load platform. So here is the top and one of the side rails. This is the other side rail and the base. And if we, interesting thing, this is obviously the public, the outside portion of it. If we flip it over, there's obviously a marking here made by the mold maker and pretty much anything that was for his own use. Um, you can see it was pretty pr crudely carved. This is the underside of the fuselage. We have the main rotor head assembly and extremely well detailed. Lots of goodies on there. And this is the, um, the top of the engine where this will slide in with a pin. We have the main landing gear wheels. Looks like an awful lot of wheels, but they're molded in two parts, so they'll all have to be glued together. We have parts for the landing gear. And they are pretty fiddly looking. But I don't see I don't see any flash on any of these parts. They are extremely well made. This is the sprue I meant to point out earlier that has what looks to be either antennae or um, various grab handles or ladders and things. They are so fine, it's going to be a challenge to take those off. But you know what? That's almost as fine as what you'd get from a photo etch sheet. Now, we have the two external fuel tanks that strap onto the sides. They look to be fairly well made. Once again, until we bring the parts together, we won't know how well they fit together, but I don't foresee there being any serious difficulties with fit. Now, the last parts molded in gray are the rotor blades. So we have two sprues, which contain two blades each. And then a single sprue to give us five blades. Now, if you're looking at this and thinking, oh my God, it's warped. Well, they did that on purpose. Any large helicopter, the blades droop when at rest. So I would rather they mold the blades pre-drooped rather than expect me to be fiddling with them. Oh, just got to get it just right. Oops, snap, crap. So I'm very happy with the rotor blades. And the last sprue is the clear sprue. Now, I'm not going to take this out of the bag until I'm ready to go, because there's already one part floating around loose. That appears to be the very nose. It's molded in clear because there's lots of windows in it. There is the main cockpit windows, uh, all the portholes. They might not be, let's say, as clear as Ravel or Tamir or something like that, but... Compared to limited run kits of 10 or 15 years ago, these are fantastic. So I'm very happy with these parts. Okay, I thought I would just give you guys some idea of how big this is going to be when it's finished. So I taped together the two fuselage portions for one side, as you can see there. So let's see, 170 second scale. How does it compare to a Bell 47? Yeah, pretty big. 
All right. How about a Huey? Yeah. Dwarf's a Huey. How about a Sea Stallion? Yeah, it's pretty big. Can we find anything that's bigger? Okay. Yeah, finally. The MI-26. Bigger than the MI-10. But if you're a helicopter fan, I don't think you'll go wrong with buying A models MI-10. Uh, might take a little bit more work to put together than a mainstream kit. But I'm certainly impressed with what I see. And I don't think you'll go wrong with it. Thanks for watching Dan's Model Works. And see you next time. Thank you.